When I was a kid, the women in my village usually gathered in a house at night and told horror stories about djinns. Thus, they unnecessarily scare themselves. Since I was a kid, I used to go to those meetings with my mother, listen to the stories and be influenced by them. Our village is an old mountain village, which is neglected and secluded. The entire village is on a slope. There is no single flat road. There's no lighting in the streets either, but there's a mill at the entrance of the village. My mother and her friends used to go to the mill in the morning and make cornmeal until the evening. There was cherry laurel and fig trees around the mill. One day, I went to the mill with my mother. The day had not dawned yet, and it could be considered night. We put sacks of corn in the mill to grind and make flour. I had to pee, and the mill didn't have any toilet. I had to pee under a fig tree. After I peed, I went back to the mill again. While I was working in the mill, my mother told me, I'll go to the house and then come back soon. Don't go anywhere. I don't know if it's psychological, but once I was alone, I started to hear someone calling me by saying, Hey, hey. I panicked when the door of the mill suddenly opened. I got out of the mill to check whether there was someone outside. Once I got out, I think I saw someone under the fig tree. The light of the mill was not lighting that area much. Maybe this was because I believed the shade I saw was looking at me. Suddenly I thought, I hope that's not a djinn. I shuddered with this thought. I went back into the mill and closed the door. However, it opened again. I panicked when the door suddenly and harshly opened again. I didn't know what to do. Instinctively, I wanted to get out and run as fast as I could. When I got out to do this, I saw dozens of shadows around the mill and in front of me. I went back in, entered the mill and sat down. I started to say prayers, I remember, while crying. I lost myself with fear. During this time, my mother arrived and took me home. I bruised the arms of my mother with my nails. However, I didn't even realize it. When I returned to normal at home, my mother, father and other members of my family asked me what happened and why I was so scared. I couldn't tell what I saw to anyone, just because I may feel the same fear again while telling it. In the following days, I wanted to forget the shadows I've seen, but my nightmares didn't allow me to do so. In my nightmares, someone was constantly trying to strangle me. These dreams were so real that I usually woke up out of breath. I had these nightmares every night when I went to bed without ablution. My family, who noticed that I lost mentality, took me to the imam of the village mosque. They told him about me. However, they didn't see any problems in me. He told me that I'm okay and the problems I suffer could be psychological. However, I wasn't crazy. My family thought mosque imams might not understand such things. And they took me to another hodger. This hodger was experienced in jinn haunting and reversing spells. The hodger put a bowl of water in front of me when we went to meet him and he said, now look at this water carefully. If you see anything in the water, tell me what you see. I swear, I saw the ones who strangled me. I told what I saw to the hodger. I answered the questions of the hodger. In the end, the hodger gave me a vefk. He said, you have to carry this vefk on you. Jinns cannot approach you as long as you carry this. They cannot harm you. However, if you take it off or lose it, they'll haunt you and they can even kill you. I've been wearing that vest for years as a necklace. After that day, I had no problems with gins. However, the problem is, I lost that vest a few days ago. I don't know what to do. I was in second grade in high school when this event happened. I was staying in a male student dormitory with a scholarship since my school was in a different city than my hometown. I was quite a successful student too. We had four beds in our dorm. Unlike the other rooms in the dormitory, our room was divided into two by an aluminium door. The room had a single door. You had to pass through the part of the room we were staying to visit the other room. Three beds and three closets were on one side, 
and three beds and three closets were on the other side. The room was for six people, but we were staying as five. Volcan, Senna and Kerchulus were sleeping on the window side, while I and Sukru were sleeping in the front section of the main door. As five roommates, we used to get along with each other very well. Thus, we used to sit together on the window side and chat here. It was a Friday evening. We agreed to buy some snacks together and chat until the morning after school. We went shopping and came to our dormitory. We met in the room by the window and started a conversation. While we were talking about things, the teacher aide visited our room and took attendance. He also said, don't stay up late. We told him, we don't have school tomorrow, we'll sleep until noon. He left. Later, we kept our conversation from where we left. It was late, and we kept talking about things. Then we started to talk about jinns and some supernatural creatures. We were telling horror stories about them without caring whether they were true or not. Since it was late at night, we were afraid of these stories, but we also couldn't stop listening to them. Meanwhile, our friend Volcan was a sleepwalker. Our room was on the second floor. Sometimes, we couldn't find Volcan in his bed when we woke up. First, we used to worry, but we got used to it soon. We were even making jokes about it. We told this to our teachers and got the key to our room from Vulcan. We used to lock the room to prevent Vulcan from going out of the room. We kept talking. It was around 4.30 to 5.30 a.m. We said, let's sleep now. Since I'm afraid of such conversations, I said, I will not go to bed. I said, I'm afraid of the other side. Keep the lights on. You can sleep. I'll text my girlfriend. My friends told me, okay. Sukru was a bit weird. He was not interested in religion. He said, screw the jinns. He also cursed them. We all told him, don't say such things and try to explain the possible dangers he can experience because of these disrespectful words in line with our beliefs. As expected, he didn't care about what we told him. Sukru went to the other section to sleep alone. I sat down, I was texting with my girlfriend. About 20 minutes passed after everyone fell asleep. However, I was still afraid due to the horror stories that I listened to all night. Thus, I couldn't fall asleep yet. The door of the room was broken. You couldn't open the door unless you put too much pressure on the knob. And sometimes you couldn't open the door at all. We even sometimes kick it. I heard the door opening. I stretched my head forward to see who entered, but couldn't see anyone. I told myself, I think Sukru left the door open and didn't care about it much. Later, the aluminium door that divides the room into two opened slowly. I thought the window in the hall was open since I felt a breeze too. I clearly felt the wind. The weather was slightly rainy and windy. I got up and closed both doors. Once I turned around, Volcan woke up. His eyes were wide open and were looking at me. He asked, Who's sleeping next to me? Since I know Volcan was a sleepwalker, I said, Don't talk rubbish. No one is sleeping next to you. Go to sleep. Volcan swore that someone is sleeping next to him. His face is not visible, and he even has black teeth. Although I started to get scared, I was still saying things like, Volcan, there's no one there. Go to sleep. Volcan got up and said, They're calling me. I said, Don't talk rubbish, bro. No one is calling you. Go to sleep. Volcan suddenly rushed towards the door with quick steps. He was a sleepwalker, but he used to move slowly. This time, there was something weird. While Volcan was about to get out of the aluminium door, I caught him from his waist and shouted, Stop! However, Volcan kept walking by dragging me. I started to shout to ask for help from my friends. I was shouting, Sukru, wake up, bro. There's something wrong with Volcan. Meanwhile, Kirchulis woke up and asked, Who's the one in Volcan's bed? He asked in fear, Volcan, who's in your bed? I turned and looked at the bed while trying to hold Volcan. There was no one in the bed. Senna also woke up to shouting and I told him, Go and tell the teacher. Something is happening in the room. Senna jumped out of the bed and went to call the teacher. Meanwhile, Kirchulis was looking at Volcan's bed and was standing still. Volcan was trying to keep going and shouting, Let go of me! They're calling me! I must go! 
He was also trying to hit me and run away from me. Suddenly, I think of Sukru. I had no power to hold back Vulcan. I yelled, Sukru, but he didn't reply. He wasn't in his bed. Suddenly, I heard breaking glass from outside. Meanwhile, the teacher also arrived. I'm not sure whether it was coincidence or fate, but our teacher aide was our religion teacher on that day. He was more knowledgeable than regular religion teachers. He was holding an old book with a red cover. He would never leave it. He entered the room with the book and caught Vulcan. Senna, me and the teacher barely put him in the bed. While we were joking, I could easily put Vulcan down on my bed, but the three of us were barely handling him. He was still shouting, leave me, I need to go. They're calling me from below. The teacher opened the book and started to read something Arabic. Vulcan was calming as he kept reading. Vulcan slept after the teacher read something for about five minutes. However, Vulcan's eyes were red. Suddenly, I remembered that Sukru was not in the bed. I said, teacher, Sukru was not in his bed. I heard glass breaking outside. He said, run. The entrance door of the dormitory was aluminium. The top part of it was glass. The glass was broken and there were blood stains. The door was locked. The teacher unlocked the door with keys and started to run. He was running while saying words in Arabic. We found Sukru lying down ahead. He had cut marks from broken glass on his arms. The teacher and I lifted Sukru. Meanwhile, a few people woke up to the sounds. They also helped us. While they were asking what happened, the teacher said, don't talk. However, he was still repeating the Arabic words. He kept saying the same words. We laid Sukru next to Vulcan to send his bed. Kirchulis was sitting silent and fixed his eyes on something on the floor. Vulcan was still sleeping and Senna was waiting next to him. The teacher said, go, bring cotton or something like that. Then he opened that old book and started to read again. Sukru was breathing, but he seemed unconscious. We were calling him, but he didn't wake up. I was trembling with fear. I felt there was a burden on me and felt lighter as the teacher kept reading. Later, I fell asleep. We were at the hospital when I woke up. All teachers, the principal and vice principals were gathered and waiting in the emergency room. All four of us but Senna were lying in beds. We had a serum in our arms. I asked, what happened teacher? He asked, what did you do at night? Senna already said, we've talked about gins, my teacher. He showed Sukru's back. There was a red hand mark on his back, which was a bit larger than a regular human hand. He said, Jinns visited you. If I wasn't there, they could kill all of you. He also said, if you wouldn't hold Vulcan, you would be just like Sukru. We stayed at the hospital for two days under observation. Our religion teacher didn't leave us alone. Then we returned to school. They let us rest for a month and we didn't visit the school. They sent us back to our hometowns. I stuttered for a year after the event, but I got better later. The hand mark on Sukru's back remained for two years. Nothing happened to anyone after the event, apart from our deteriorated psychology. Once we got back to school, they placed all of us in different rooms. I couldn't stand everything and dropped out of school. I couldn't sleep in the dormitory. Our religion teacher still calls us and asks whether anything else happened. Sometimes, goods that I remember in their place get lost. When I talked about it, my teacher told me that jinns are playing games with you. If they would haunt you, you would not have stayed like this until now. My mother took me to a hodger and ordered an amulet. I do not take it off, even while taking a bath. Year 1986. There was no electricity or roads in the village. The villagers had to go to Elazig, a city of Turkey, to meet their needs. The road to the centre was two to three kilometres from the village. It was necessary to be on this road at 4.30am to reach Elazig. There was only one car that went to Elazig. The car was coming back at noon. The road used to go to Elazig was called Demon Creek by the villagers, and they thought that strange events were happening there. 
and that it wasn't auspicious. Me and two of my friends started preparing at 3 p.m. to hit the road. The road we had to cross that included the Demon Creek to reach Alizig was on our minds. First, we planned to cross the Ridgeway, then the Demon Creek, and enter the highway that leads to Elazig. Afterwards, we hit the road. We lit our cigarettes while being in deep conversation. It was utter darkness. There wasn't even moonlight. We were slowly encouraging ourselves to cross the Demon Creek and thinking about that moment. We were getting close to the Demon Creek, but first we had to cross the Ridgeway. The path was so narrow that two people could not walk side by side and it was filled with big bushes. We were moving in a single line. I was the last one in the row. The first guy in the row named Kamal suddenly stopped and he mentioned that there was a black dog watching us without moving on the way. I thought to myself, it's one of our village dogs. My friends were very nervous. We were getting more scared of the stories that we had heard since our childhood. I was scared and started reciting a Muslim prayer. The dog suddenly got out of the way and disappeared after moving a few meters away in the bushes. After the dog had disappeared, we thought to ourselves what the dog was doing there and continued to walk. After walking for one to two minutes, Kamal suddenly stopped again and yelled, it's the same dog again, Hassan, before moving a few steps back. Three of us didn't know what to do because of confusion and fear. The dog was looking at us again. I recited the prayer again. The dog stood up and vanished again in the bushes. My friend said, Hassan, let's go back and don't go there. And I said, we need to cross this road. If we don't, we'll have to tomorrow. We'll use this road for shopping and calm them down. Then we continued on our path. My friends were scared. Of course, so do I. We were talking about why the dog appeared at us again. I tried to calm them down by saying it's just a common dog and following us. We continued on our path. We couldn't believe what we had seen after three to five minutes. A coal black goat was standing on the road blocking the way. We were so scared. We started to pray. The goat suddenly disappeared. The disappearance of the goat made me comprehend that these events weren't ordinary at all, and we got scared seriously, but going back was unnecessary. I calmed my nerves and went to the first door of the line, and I backed my friends. I was both praying and continuing our route. It was only a sharp corner left for the Demon Creek. We were shocked when we finished crossing the sharp corner. What we had seen was indescribable. Long, white as snow, shining silhouette, shape, mass, whatever. It was obvious that it had arms and legs, but its face was ambiguous. And so it started to create sounds of rumble, scream, crying. We closed our ears with our hands. We were throwing ourselves out of fear and flapping on the ground. At the same time, there was blind shining. I started to recite my known prayers. My friends were yelling, cursing, and they didn't know what they were doing. I was thinking about how to escape the situation and staying calm. I dragged my friends out of that incident. The screaming voices turned into laughter while we were escaping from there. The laughter echoed in our minds. We headed back to the village, but we didn't know he would come back. At the entrance of the village, there was the house of Kamal. When Kamal's parents saw us, they couldn't believe their eyes. They said, what's the matter with you? You have paleness in your face. We couldn't speak, trembling continuously, making noises like dummies. They informed our relatives. They also came here. They tried to grasp the situation with their mind. I rested for a while and drank some water and told them the story. The villagers were stunned. They told us to thank God that you could come in one piece. We thought that we saved ourselves, but from sunrise to sunrest for 40 days, we had heavy headaches, skin rash, and huge herpes in our lips. I used to work at multiple different clothing stores at the same mall near Cleveland, Ohio. 
I started working there when I was 17 and the energy felt very off and I would see shadows all the time. But it was Hollister after all, so it was very dark in there with tons of plants. So I discounted it as that. It wasn't until I worked at Abercrombie and Fitch that it was thought we had a little girl ghost in there. Hangers could be heard moving in rooms we knew no one was in after the store had closed. Many incidents occurred there, but the one that sticks out to me is that we were there until 4am one morning doing a floor set and there had been 13 of us there. By the end of it, it was down to three and two people were taking the trash outs and one girl was left inside. She heard a little voice say, I want my mommy. The next summer, I was home from college. I worked at another store at this same mall in a different section. This is where I truly believed we had something going on. I have many, many stories about this store. Our manager would get calls every night at four in the morning about the alarms going off and the police coming. But the alarm company kept saying it had to be mice. We never found mice droppings in the store. We had a conversion tracker under the doorway that would give our company the ratio of people who came in versus people who came in and bought something. The tracker was set up to only track people over four feet tall to not add children into the percentage from the hours from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Our conversion tracker caught something over four feet tall walking into the store at 4 a.m. the same time the alarms were going off. The energy of the store felt extremely off. I'd hold my pee for hours so I wouldn't have to go into the back room alone. My manager was in the back and she felt her hair being pulled and children laughing at it and we'd hear noises coming from the back of the store and things out of the corner of our eyes walking in the back. The most clear one I saw was I was walking in the back sock room which wasn't very big and saw something about seven feet tall and was grey, staticky looking between the wall and the walkway, about five feet from me. Our mannequins were beige and I know what I saw. A little girl came in and tugged on her mom's skirt while pointing to the back of the store and said, Mommy, there's a ghost in there. We were doing our annual inventory and the manager told an employee to get up on the ladder and make sure we weren't missing anything and to look in offhand places in the store just to make sure everything was accounted for. We had these fake exposed pipes in the store, so the employee looked in there. He found a balled up t-shirt that had something about death and skulls on it. No one would have put that shirt up in there. I no longer work there, but I always wonder what was truly going on and why these spirits were trapped in this relatively new mall, if they were tied to the land it was built on. I'd love to learn what people think could have been going on or what it was that was bothering us, or if anyone knows the history of the area. People say this a lot, never mock a ghost, but most people think you can't mock something that doesn't exist. I believed you couldn't mock something that doesn't exist. How do you expect me to believe a concept similar to Santa or God? Well, no one truly understands or believes until they get given some sort of sign. I always thought the idea of ghosts was stupid. Just something people can make petty money on by fools willing to pay to watch them run around and scream at any given noise. Despite not believing in them, I'm an adrenaline junkie, so I loved going to haunted places for the thrill of it. This started on holiday when I got offered a tour of a haunted basement. I was around 12 at the time, and I caught something on camera I'll never forget. It was the full face of an older boy at the end of the corridor in the basement, his mouth wide open. For so long, I brushed it off as being a light or something completely normal. I was so ignorant. But years later, at the age of 16, something happened that opened my mind forever. I mindlessly mocked a ghost. I was in one of the most haunted places in the UK and my ignorant self thought it was fake. I took my finger off the Ouija board while mocking the ghosts, calling it bullshit. It was cold and I went sweaty hot, unlike the others with me, and I fainted. I woke in a puddle of my own blood. It was a warmth like no other. It was when my mind went loopy from the heat that I started taking my coat off and undressing. The warmth wouldn't go. When I woke up in that pool of blood, I was cold again, 
but almost freezing. Something was watching me in the basement, it must have been. When I fainted, I saw something standing behind me. Now, a year later, I study the paranormal. I contact spirits safely if I wanted to, but my advice to everyone now is never mock a ghost, no matter what you believe. It's not safe. Don't play around with this type of stuff. I've always been into the horror genre, and I'm very intrigued by people's paranormal experiences, but I can't say that I'd actually believe in ghosts myself. I always try to find a logical explanation, no matter what the situation is. But there are a couple of rather creepy experiences I've had, which I just can't figure out. I'd love to hear your thoughts about these two experiences. The first occasion took place late in the evening, when I was in the middle of a phone call with my friend. All of a sudden, the lights started to flicker. Unusual, but I wasn't creeped out by this. Not until the phone went crazy. My friend's voice got all distorted and soon it sounded like someone was outright screaming into the phone. No need to say that this freaked me enough to end the call. My friend called me back soon after that. She told me she didn't notice anything weird on her end. I headed to bed not long after we ended the call. As usual, my cat followed me, but this time he just sat on the bedside table and stared at the bedroom door. He absolutely refused to look anywhere else, no matter what I did, just keenly staring in that direction. I fell asleep at some point, but he kept doing that for the rest of the time I was awake. Only reasonable explanation I've been able to come up with is some type of electromagnetic pulse or something like that. That could explain the electronics, but my cat's weird behaviour is still a mystery. The second occasion was weirder than the first one. My roommate went away for the weekend, and I was left alone at home. As usual, she made sure to lock her room door after her, and did the usual double check by trying the door handle. Maybe an hour after she left, I was sitting in the living room, browsing the internet and stuff like that. From my peripheral vision, I saw how the door of her room began to creep open. I had seen her lock it, so naturally I was freaking out that someone had been lurking in there, opening the door from the inside. The room was totally dark and I couldn't see inside, so I just sat there, scared shitless. Eventually, when nothing else happened, I had no choice but to go and take a peek inside. I couldn't see anyone in there, but the room was freezing and smelled absolutely horrid. I checked if she had left the window open, but it was shut tight. Here in Finland, houses are typically built to be very thermally efficient, and they're not that cold even during the winter. Our building wasn't an exception, and this happened in fall, when it wasn't even that cold outside yet. I have no idea what could have caused the smell. I had been in her room before she left, and there was nothing odd about the smell. After checking the room, I just locked the door and tried my best to forget about it. When my roommate returned a few days later, the room was completely normal. No coldness, no smell, nothing. She didn't sleep very well after I told her what happened. This story takes place a few weekends ago when my friend and I were driving to a show about an hour and a half away from where we live. He had picked me up from my house and the sky was clear, but it started raining heavily about 15 to 20 minutes into the drive. It became so heavy that my friend and I weren't talking to each other at all and the music was turned way down so that he could focus on the road, which was practically invisible due to the rain. It was like this for another 10 to 15 minutes, but then the rain lightened up again. This pattern would continue throughout our whole drive, to the show and back. We drove for a while, and were talking about and laughing about that we didn't have to focus so much on driving. Then, in front of us, about 30 feet, we saw a man walking on the left side of the road, along the grass strip that separates the lanes going in different directions. The man was older, maybe around 60, black, and wearing all white. I went quiet. I saw this man just appear out of thin air in front of the car. The view was clear and the road was straight, 
so he couldn't have crossed the road or been walking for a long time without one of us seeing him. I hadn't been looking at my phone or at my friend either, so I couldn't have just been distracted. He just came out of nowhere. It took a moment before my friend to notice him. We zipped by this man, and my friend yelled something like, Holy shit, where did that guy come from? We both were freaking out a little now, and I turned to look out the back window while my friend checked the rear view mirror. Neither of us could see the man at all. He vanished just as quickly as he appeared. My friend worriedly asked me if I saw the same thing as him, or if I had seen the guy before and he just hadn't been paying attention. I told him I hadn't, and jokingly asked if he believed in ghosts now. I've always been a believer and have a few other experiences before, but he's a huge skeptic about all those sorts of things. He didn't answer me for a moment, but then he started laughing and said, yeah, maybe I do. We moved on with the conversation after a few minutes. After the event, we both kept our eye out for the man. Of course, we didn't see him, but it was still a crazy experience. I rarely have a paranormal experience with someone else there to confirm that I'm not crazy. I still have no idea what happened exactly, but I'm wondering if anyone has had any similar experiences on the road. I want to say this was around Christmas time. I live in a split level ranch layout and downstairs we have a type of living room. Down there is mainly used for my little siblings play area. But there are two couches and one of which can fold out into a futon. I would sleep down there a few times throughout the week just because I enjoy the openness of the room. It's not the most comfy thing to sleep on. Therefore, it takes a little bit to actually fall asleep. This hasn't happened since. This one night, I did nothing out of the ordinary before falling asleep. I just watched some YouTube and then after a certain point, I decided I was too tired to continue. So I put down my phone and closed my eyes. I remember being in a state in which I felt like I was half awake and half asleep. I can almost explain it as my body was in autopilot and I was just watching things occurring. I had no control. In this state, I look towards the end of the futon. I see what I believe to be some sort of woman. I say this because it seemed human-like, but I couldn't tell. It was trying to scare me. I wasn't giving in. She looked at me with a confused look, almost like she was saying, why am I not staring you? She then started moving around, trying to scare me again, but with no success. I believe I went back to sleep after this. I then became aware once again. This time, my eyes were closed. I felt something slowly tugging on my arm. The strength began slowly increasing until it stopped. Then out of nowhere, I felt a huge amount of force drag me by my arm. My eyes opened and I saw many colors spiraling around me. It was almost like the background of the transitions in that 70s show. It was a couple of months ago, late November through late December. It started out with feeling extremely exhausted and depressed. And I think that's when this entity decided to prey on me. Dreams are where it started. I would hear things like chantings of Satan, Satan, Satan. Or one, two, Satan is coming for you. Then the feeling of dread, like I was about to be dragged by my toes to hell. Then there was the dream that a possessed doll was chasing me around a labyrinth of a house, screaming, Satan will get you. So I am religious, so I prayed on it and asked God for help. It didn't help. This thing still stalked me. It wasn't afraid of God and that shook me to my core. My boss and I talked about it because he was a very religious man. He sent me some prayers to say, it helped for maybe a day or two. Then things got worse, much, much worse. I was in the shed at work one day and heard something growling at me. I thought, okay, maybe an animal. Looked around for one, nothing there, and nothing can get under the shed. That was odd, I thought, but got what I needed and went about my day. Well, that same day, as I stood in the dining room, I saw a tall black figure. There was only legs and a torso run across our parking lot. 
told my manager about it because I thought maybe it was a person. She went to look and nobody was out there. So this is getting weird and terrifying. Well, the only person I had told about it was my boss. So finally, I broke down and told my friend. She tells me, I hate to tell you this, but the other night, I woke up and there was a shadow figure leaning over your bed. That night, I had a dream that this thing was trying to attack me and woke up to my bed shaking and something growling at me. All right, now I was petrified. Told my mom about it and she told me I should talk to my granny about it because she's dealt with this her whole life. So I do, and she tells me to buy a crucifix and always wear it. I do that and it doesn't help. I'm at a total loss at this point. What do I do? I finally put it on Facebook. Hey, this is what I'm going through at this point. I don't care if people think I'm insane. I'm thinking maybe I am insane. So a lot of people reach out and someone suggests reading Psalms 91. I try that and praise the Lord it works. Well, sort of. I had a dream that night about the thing, and I tried my hardest to call out to my loved ones for help, but couldn't talk. It was silencing me, no matter what I heard. My deceased uncle appeared, looked at me and back at me, and said, Kayla, I'll be damned if I let that thing hurt you. I saw it one more time after that, looked at it, and said, I don't think so. It left, and I haven't seen it since. I work in a public high school that used to be a military academy. The old part of the building still exists as the administration section of the building. I attended this school and had never heard any rumours of it being haunted until I started working there. During my first week of work, I was in the old part of the building. I suddenly smelled cigar smoke. I mentioned it to my co-worker and he just laughed and said, Oh, that's just the ghost. I've since learned that a lot of people experience this in the old part of the building. I understand that this is easily explainable and could be nothing. My second and more unexplainable experience occurred about two years into my employment and was also experienced by one of my co-workers. We were doing some wiring work in a small closet. We had just finished up and shut the heavy solid wood door. My co-worker was leaning against the door and we were talking. Suddenly, there was a loud boom and the door physically moved like something slammed into it from inside the closet. We opened it back up and there was nothing there. I have no explanation for this. While leaving the school late at night, I always felt like there's something watching me from the attic window of the old building. One time, I even thought I saw a face in the window. No one has access to the attic because it's kind of dangerous and locked. I've been up there a few times to do wiring work. It still has all the old wood and wallpaper and such from the 1800s. The attic area used to be dorms for the military school. There's been electricity and ductwork added up there, so it's not easy to walk around. I know other employees who swear they've had experiences as well. The facilities director and a teacher both saw someone in a cadet outfit standing in a hallway on different nights. When spoken to, the cadet went around a corner and vanished. Our maintenance guy said that he was working in the old part of the building and a kid wearing old timey clothes appeared under the ladder he was standing on. He told the kid he wasn't supposed to be there and looked away for a second and the kid just vanished. One of the overnight custodians swears that he hears horses walking at night sometimes. I'm sure there are other employees that have seen or heard things but it's not something that comes up in normal conversations. I remember it like it was yesterday. About two weeks after my father passed away from cancer in the summer of 2009, I was sitting in the family room with my mother. I was watching TV and flipping through the channels and stopped on VH1. And the song that was playing was Eric Clapton's tears in heaven. I remember my mom listening to the song and saying, your dad like Eric Clapton, as she stood in the entrance to the family room and me on the couch. All of a sudden, the blinds to our left shut closed all very abruptly. 
Now, I don't know about anyone else, but when have you guys ever had the blinds on your house suddenly closed by themselves? Seeing that happen literally in front of my eyes, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. It was like a warm, comforting feeling because I knew all along it was my father. I wasn't scared. It was just a surprise after all. Fast forward about two months later, after we had his wake at the house. My mother and I had an argument one night. We never really had a strong relationship with each other growing up. I was mostly with my dad. She was closer to my older brother. I think mostly because my brother was abused by our bi biological father when he was born, till about three years old. Anyways, after our arguments, I'll never forget what my mom told me at the end of it. She said to me, I hope daddy tickles your feet tonight. Really not thinking much of it, I went to bed. And as you can guess, that's exactly what happened. As I'm laying there in bed, staring at the ceiling, I feel the room go cold as ice. And when I say that, I could see my breath in the room. It was as if the whole room was frozen over. I wrapped my body quickly, not even thinking about what my mother told me earlier. I left my feet hanging off the bed and felt the cold sting of fingers at the bottom of my feet. Again, no fear at the time, because even at 12 years old, to be naive at the fact that this could be anyone else besides my father, I laid there telling myself, how can this be real? It felt cold, not like ice cubes to my feet, but an indescribable feeling really of how it felt to feel such an experience. When I looked towards the end of my bed, thinking I would see my father there, and seeing the complete emptiness of the room instead, the pain in my heart at the time, man, let me tell you, this is now about 13 or 14 years ago. I'm 25 years old now and barely am I laying here telling this story. To believe that there's so many people out there that don't believe in the paranormal, well, I've experienced it firsthand. Since then, I've never had another experience. Growing up in central Louisiana, I had always heard of Frenchtown Road growing up. How it was haunted, and there was a witch and various occult activities and KKK meetings. My dad always told me he would bring me, but the first time I went was Halloween night 2020, around 12pm. Me, my friend's mom, driving, and three of my friends, decided to drive down to Frenchtown and check out an old abandoned building that they had been to a few times. So in the dark, we drive down Frenchtown, under the bridge, notorious for cars mysteriously stopping under it and people being hung from it. You can read about it in the weird Louisiana book or Google it. We eventually get to a driveway and park and we all got out and made the trek toward the old house in the dark through a field. My friends had checked the house out around two weeks back and it was still there. But when we got to the house, there was nothing there but the foundation, with no signs of construction or any debris, and there was grass growing over the foundation. After freaking out a bit, and standing on the foundation scaring each other, we decided to head back to the car. Now this is when things get much crazier and paranormal. We all get in the car and it won't start. Everyone except me and my best friend were flipping out, but eventually the car started. We quickly pulled off, but not a minute after we get to the bridge. We're probably going around 40 miles an hour, and the second we got onto the bridge, the car shut off. My friend's mom was hyperventilating and crying, trying to get the car to start again, but this was the most upset I had ever seen her. After about two minutes in the pitch black, the car came back on, and we got the hell out of there. One of my friends said she saw a figure in a white dress on the road on the way back but it could have just been nerves. To this day, this is the most unexplainable thing to have ever happened to me, and I fully believe it was paranormal in nature. We lived in a big old army house, in the middle of beautiful woodland, miles from anywhere. It was very dark at night, and very quiet with no passing traffic. The house had double doors from the dining room into the sitting room. We had a huge elderly cat, Tom, and adopted a greyhound, Dave. 
Tom could stand his own ground, but as Dave had high prey drive, we made sure that they weren't in a room alone until they had got used to each other. So Tom had the run of the kitchen and dining room, and we kept the double doors closed into the sitting room. Tom quickly learned that if he scratched three times against the double doors and headbutted them a few times, someone would open the doors and he could come in and taunt the greyhound. The double doors were old and heavy, but Tom was a big cat and he could shake them slightly when headbutting them. Some months later, at a very grand old age, Tom died and was buried in the garden he so loved. I was heartbroken and became sleepless. I therefore found myself one night sitting watching TV, Dave alongside me in the early hours. I should mention at this point that I'm a very pragmatic person. I was wide awake and focused on the TV when I heard scratch, scratch, scratch at the double doors, exactly the way in which Tom used to tell us he wanted to enter the room. The hair stood up on the back of my neck, but I figured I had misheard until it happened again, followed by the doors moving as if they were being pushed from the other side. This repeated several times. The doors were moving to such a degree that it looked as if they could imminently burst open. I never believed in being paralyzed with fear until that day. Dave, sitting beside me, stared fixedly at the doors. Eventually, I managed to flee upstairs with Dave at my side and lay in bed shaking. I woke early, but my husband was already downstairs and obviously checking out the double doors. I shakily asked, why are you doing that? To which he replied, the blood draining from his face. Oh my God, you've seen it too. This had apparently been going on at intervals ever since Tom died and he had just witnessed it again. We scoured the house, stamped up and down the stairs to see if we could make the doors move, went through every possible explanation and found none. We reassured each other, it's just Tom and we loved him. But after that, we left the double doors open all the time so we never had to do it again. I don't know exactly how old I was back then, but I think I was probably around fifth grade. All I know is I was still not in high school back then. It was the middle of the night. My mom and younger brother and me slept in one big bed on the second floor of our house, and there was a window across from us. It had no glass, just basically a square hole we call a window, and attached a dirty cloth we called a curtain to block the outside and to close the window when it's night time. Everyone except me was asleep, because I have this tradition where I don't sleep until I pray. Because when I was even younger back then, I was always afraid to go to sleep for some reason, and mum and dad told me that if you pray, God will protect you from all the bad creatures while you're asleep, and you won't have nightmares and whatnot. It eventually became a habit of mine though, whenever I go to sleep I pray, and my prayers back then were so long, I kid you not, that even I was annoyed by it. So it usually takes around when everyone is finally asleep, except me, to actually force myself to start praying and finally go to sleep. Like I said, it was probably midnight when it happened. I was about near finished praying when I felt this cold breeze I've never felt before, even till now. It wasn't like any cold wind or ordinary electric fan wind. I might even say colder than an aircon wind. The wind passed by me and that's when I opened my eyes from my praying and looked at the window where a wind from the outside swept the curtains away to make an opening for this white shining orb that came floating in. I was dumbstruck to be honest. Then it came floating towards me. That's when my already fast beating heart beated more harder and faster and I could literally feel it beating in my chest. When it was halfway towards me I hid in my blankets and closed my eyes, kept praying so I could finish my prayer and finally sleep when I was done. I opened my eyes again and saw through the fabrics of my blanket and saw it was circling on top of my head and face. It wasn't like very close to me, just floating on top, barely in hand's reach if you reach hard enough. I just closed my eyes and forced myself to sleep. The next day, I didn't tell anyone because I just thought of it as my imagination or just a dream. 
I'm mixed with reality. Or maybe I don't know what's just me going crazy. Well, I would have kept thinking it was just my imagination if it didn't happen again. It actually creeps me because when it happened for a second and last time, it was the exact same settling, exactly the same. The same spot on the bed my brother and mom and me took looked as if it was somewhere on the same time of the night. Everyone was asleep except me because I was too lazy to pray again like any other night. I don't think the blanket was the same though, but maybe it was. I don't really remember. I was on the part of my prayer where I was nearly finished. Felt that weird cold breeze again. Looked at the window. Another wind pulled away the curtain to make an opening. The orb came in, but this time it was flickering. I think it shone more brightly and was more white, if that makes sense. But I think it was also kind of like it was weakening because of the constant flickering. I ducked under my blanket like last time, finished my prayer, opened my eyes again, and it was doing what it was doing like last time on the same spot. But I think the way it circled grew bigger than last time. And it was flickering so much now too. Disappearing and reappearing again and again. I forced myself to sleep like last time. Then I told my mom who was with my aunt when I told her. They told me that it was just my imagination. I told them how could it be an imagination though. Because it can't be just imagination. I felt the cold weird wind when it wasn't even windy and our electric fan was pointing at my lower area. It couldn't have gotten my whole body, nor could it be that cold out of nowhere. And the curtain physically moved with the wind. I even heard the swoosh of the wind that moved it. And the orb too. It can't be in my imagination, because even when I closed my eyes and ducked under my blanket, it was still there. It can't be my imagination, because if it is, it then means my touch sight, and even my hearing, imagined it all. And also, forgot to add, those two nights it wasn't raining, or was windy at all. It was just a normal, weatherless night. And I honestly believe those weren't ordinary winds, because the way it moved the curtain was as if to make way for that orb. And the cold, weird wind that I felt, it was as if it was something to grab my attention. Now when I tell this story to people, most of them think either that's creepy or weird, or trying to explain it with something ordinary or with science and logic, but they could never explain all the incidents happening together. The most bizarre ones being, maybe it was God, Jesus, guardian angel testing you because you were praying. I seriously think that's not the case to be honest, cause come on. One that made me feel bad was that my grandma said that maybe it was a lost soul or ghost trying to ask for help or something along those lines. Because it's known in some of my family members that I've seen some things back then that no one else had seen. It wasn't crazy or anything, but just having little glimpses of some things in the corner of my eye or just feeling something. Sometimes, albeit rarely glimpses of the future. Me and my aunt have the same thing, but it's not as big or as strong as an open third eye. I seriously don't want it to open if you ask me. She was 15 years old when this occurred, while she was home in the middle of the night. Late spring had arrived. She thought it was June. She remembered that because her windows were open and there was a breeze coming in, the temperature was not so hot that there was a need for air conditioning. She could smell the lily of the valley. The scent wafted in through the open window. After laundering her sheets that day, she reveled in the crisp and fresh feeling. The night was pleasant. It was cool, but not cold in the early evening. She was in a deep sleep when she woke up. Grogginess was her first feeling, and confusion came over her as she contemplated what had happened for a moment. She was laying on her side with the covers pulled up, almost over her head. The night had turned a little chilly. Rather than get up and close the windows, she unconsciously opted to pull the covers up. At first, the grogginess was powerful, and she almost went back to sleep when she felt a feeling of sheer dread. There was this feeling that she was in danger, and goosebumps developed on her skin. 
She didn't move, and she stayed frozen in place, not wanting to know what was happening. She felt like she needed to keep still and not move. Whatever this was would go away without bothering her. She heard a beeping sound that gave out five or six mid-toned beeps. It almost sounded like an older digital alarm clock. A strange sound, like rustling and scampering or something or someone, was the next thing she heard. Like the noise came directly over her bed. Terror began washing over her, but she knew that she must look and see what was happening. She couldn't keep her head covered and ignore it any longer. Reluctantly, she turned her head and pulled down the blanket. Over her bed was a ceiling fan. She saw a figure hanging on the fan. It looked like a cloth dummy or doll, child-sized, with limbs that had no hands or feet. The ends of the arms and legs looked rounded. She wasn't sure how it got there and why it was there. For just a moment, she thought it was a prank by someone. Within what couldn't be longer than taking a breath, this thing dropped down three to five inches. She was startled and she let out a scream, yet the cry seemed stifled. It didn't come out as loud as she had intended. This dummy roll had its head turned upwards toward the ceiling fan. She realized that was the back of its head when the head started to turn to look at her. It had a drawn set of glasses on the face. There was no nose that she remembers and a horizontal line for a mouth. It felt like this thing was staring at her. The dummy was focused on her intensely. She was paralyzed in fear and couldn't move. Bile came up in her throat and the horizontal line for the mouth slowly curved upward into a smile. The thing was happy that she was frightened she had a strong feeling come over her. At once, she had a feeling like she should not see the dummy. She knew this thing wanted to hurt her, and she knew she had to try to run. She couldn't explain it. She couldn't say that the thoughts were telepathic communication. At this moment, the feeling of staying where she was came over her. It won't take her this time, she thought. She felt this thing was looking after her for some nefarious reason to kidnap her when whatever this thing determined was the time to take her. She didn't hear individual words come into her mind. She felt it. She was uncertain about how to explain it. The experience was like a thought that popped into her head. She didn't feel like she was receiving a message or hearing words in her mind. Somehow, she knew these thoughts that came into being in her mind were not her own. Moments after the idea of running came into her mind, and these intrusive thoughts manifested, this thing jumped down on the end of her bed and jumped to the floor. The dummy ran for her bedroom door, opened it, and exited her room. Most people say it happened so fast. That was an understatement for me. When he jumped and ran, it was like he was a video on fast forward. Her door stood wide open. Her parents heard something loud and within some seconds ran out of their room, saw her door open and her in bed visibly traumatised. Her father walked through the hallway to the patio door. It stood wide open. For some reason, the front door was wide open as well. Her father asked her what happened. Why were the doors open? She was still shaken up and couldn't tell him what had happened. She told him she woke up to find someone in her room. She said this person ran out. Her mum came to her and sat on the side of her bed. Jane, who was it? She explained to her it was dark, but she didn't think it was someone she knew. She couldn't explain to them what she saw. They wouldn't believe her. She was confident she was awake, but this was so unusual. Her parents later thought she had a sleepwalking dream and she opened all the doors and made the sounds. At least, that's what they said. But she believes they knew there was no way she had time to open all the doors and get back into her room and to bed before they came out of their bedroom to look and see what was making the noise that woke them up. Sometimes they would say, that time that someone may have hidden in your room. She scoured the internet, hoping to find someone else who had a similar experience. And the closest kind of thing that she found was when people came across these entities known as stick figures. It reminded her 
because this was a thing you would not expect to see in your real life and moving and interacting with the environment. People had a feeling of fear or uncertainty when encountering these things. She shares this in the hope others may have heard something similar happen to them. She's still traumatised by the event. If she wakes up in the middle of the night out of the blue, she fears this thing will come and take her. Sometimes she has dreams of this thing, a kind of replay of what happened to her, like post-traumatic stress disorder. She believes those dreams are not reliving a traumatic event. Instead, this dummy was projecting these into her mind as a way to feed off her fear from afar. She doesn't know what the dummy doll's true intentions were, but she felt like it enjoyed her intense fear. It seemed like it got satisfaction from her energy. This event happened 30 years ago, and her later feelings after having these dreams. She tells you this as best as she can. What occurred, and what she believes happened. To properly tell you the story, I must lay out the situation of what was going on. So a few years back, about 2009 if I'm not mistaken, me and my family lived in Virginia. My father usually came home in the late hours of the night due to his job, forcing him to work late. My mother thought it'd be fun to take me and my sister out for some ice cream. It was a completely normal night and nothing seemed out of the ordinary, even right before we left. So we were driving to a restaurant and my mother's phone started ringing. My mother hit confirm on the car's console and my father's voice was on the other end of the line. His tone sounded perplexed and he had a slight stutter in the moment. It was something like I hadn't heard in his voice before. Hey, is Seal with you guys? He asked. Uh, yeah, why? My mother replied. What? I just heard him. Th that that's impossible. He's right in the car with us, my mother said. We could hear the sounds of a series of thumps in the background. I'll call you back, my father said, before we ended the call. He later told us that he heard of a young child with a voice akin to mine say, Daddy? As he heard footsteps slamming down the stairs, like I'd always do whenever I'd go down those stairs. My father called, yeah, to the child he thought was stomping down the stairs. He got no response, but more slamming footsteps. My father said he had seen the shadow of a child coming down the stairs, and when it rounded the corner of the steps, the shadow just dissipated when whatever it was would have been in view. He was sitting on the couch watching TV when it happened, and he could see the lower half of the stairs from his seat. So it freaked him out, and he immediately called us to ask if I was home. I still have no clue to this day why whatever it was, chose to mimic me, but I'm glad it intended to do no harm. A few years ago, my wife was sitting in a restaurant when a waitress came over to take her order, but kept looking at her strangely. The waitress leaves with the order, and my wife's left sits there wondering what the waitress's problem was. 20 minutes later, the waitress comes back with the food and starts to chat to my in-laws. She then looks at my wife and says, you've got the gift, but you're blocking it. Later indicating the gift was contacting and seeing spirits. Turns out my wife has seen spirits, but only passed on pets. Fast forward a few years and we lose our nephew to cancer. Four months on and we lost our daughter to sepsis. Another six months pass by in a complete blur. My wife and I then go and see a local psychic. We had never met this lady before, but we heard good things. We went to her home to sit down, and before we started, she looked at my wife and again she's told, you have the gift, but you're blocking it. Now the first time in the restaurant, we kind of brushed it off, but two complete strangers saying exactly the same thing can't be a coincidence. We finished our session, which was amazing. And as we left, she said to my wife that she has a gift and should use it. It's now been four years since our daughter's passing, and since we've seen the psychic, my wife's tried to unblock her abilities and learn how to use them. She kind of has, but she can't control them. There have been several occasions where she's seen our nephew and our daughter, 
and she's also felt my uncle's and grandfather's presence, either just standing beside us, or in our home, or just feeling they're around. But even though she's tried to communicate, she doesn't get a response apart from the odd smile, and that's about it. But we were at our daughter's grave one night recently, our nephews a few rows down. I left my wife with our daughters while I checked on our nephews. I came back to her and she was scared, almost shaking. I got her in the car and we left. She then explained to me that she felt a massive presence in the graveyard. She explained it as if she was at the front of a queue with lots of people just staring at her from behind. She also said some didn't feel friendly. Now she hasn't had a lot of contact since then and nothing negative to make sure we haven't gone to the graveyard in the evening. But she still wants to learn how to use her abilities, but she wants to keep safe. But we have no idea how to learn how to use them, how to refine them, but most importantly, keep her safe and the nasty away. Can anyone help advise us how to do this? There isn't an idiot's guide as it were, and no classes. So what do we do?